Go ahead and turn your Bibles to James chapter 2. And tonight we're going to be talking about the problem uh, with partiality. And so we have finally made it into chapter 2. I know some of you are probably thinking that we're never going to get out of chapter 1, but we are finally here. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13 tonight. And over the the last uh, two weeks, we dealt with uh, the importance of submitting to the Word of God and, and then doing what it says, right? Applying and doing is where it's, it's really been a heavy theme so far uh, that we must do both of those things. That James said that those that hear the Word only and do not do what it says are deceiving themselves. And so that was kind of a, a really tough couple of weeks to really examine ourselves, you know, because we, we can uh, be deceived, especially folks that grow up in church, right? That we can just get settled into the routine of, of going through the motions and I, I come to church and I come to Sunday school and I come to discipleship training. And I do all these things uh, because I've been trained to do that. So we have to examine our own hearts and say, have I truly uh, uh, submitted myself to the word? And, and have I truly, am I doing what the word of God says? And so, you know, this question of, of you know, what are we deceiving our, ourselves about? You know, and, and, and James will say, primarily your salvation right that's what we talked about that uh, this uh, the relationship with with jesus that uh, what they claim with their mouth is not supported by uh, their behavior or their actions that there is no submission to the authority of the word no seriousness about righteousness or holy living no desire for the things of god that 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 church really doesn't matter the bible doesn't really matter the mission of the gospel doesn't really matter see that life is still all about you and what you want and so james was saying that's a problem that's a real big problem see uh, that all these things that you you think because you prayed a prayer once that that you and god are now all good and, and that you're okay that you've got your hell insurance now i want to be clear that true you and i are saved in an instant the, through genuine repentance and faith in jesus but the genuineness of your faith will have works of righteousness that will accompany your claims, right? That's what James is saying over and over again, that these two things balance one another out, that you will be changed, that you will think differently, that you will talk differently, that you will behave differently, that there's, you'll have new priorities and new desires and, and new plans and purposes for your life, that you will want to be in church, that you will want to be in Sunday school, you'll want to be in discipleship training, that you'll want to read and study your Bible, right? You'll want to spend time with other believers in fellowship and in service. So all these things are outflows of submitting yourself to the Word of God and then uh, doing what the Word of God says, that you would be a new creation, right? That's kind of the verse of the day, Second Corinthians 5.17. I know it's even on our sign. It's on our sign down at the end of the road. This, this is a really, God's trying to say something. This verse is just over and over again. We're going to hear it one more time. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so tonight, James will show us another big way that our lives are, are made new, that uh, true Christians will strive to treat everyone the same without partiality and without favoritism, right? That's what he's saying. And, and, and apparently that was an issue early on, even in the early church, that you know we may not think it's that big of a deal, but apparently uh, God does. And so that's what we're going to spend our time talking a, a, about tonight, that, uh, that, that Scripture uh, would say that God so loved the world, and that means, that, that means all people, right? The world means all people, and that Scripture says that whosoever will, and that means all people, that Scripture says that every tribe, nation, and tongue, that means all people. And so we don't, we don't see discrimination here. We don't see favoritism. We don't see partiality. See, the Apostle Paul would say it like this about our new identity in Christ in Galatians 3, uh, 26 to 28. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And see, the problem that was really going on here, more than likely, in the early church was that there was a danger of being divided from the start because of the division between Gentiles and Jews, right? That was the real big barrier that was going on there. It was this pre-existing 
racial divide that, that, that was long ingrained in the people that the Jews were taught to keep themselves separate from the people of the land. And all the way back to the beginning that Gentiles and the pagans were unclean sinners. And so this teaching uh, uh, w- would be abolished through the cross of Jesus Christ and the new covenant. But thousands of years of this way of thinking would not go away easily, right? And we can understand that, right? We're, uh, just as we understand how, uh, how ingrained things in, in our churches can be that have been going on for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years and some of y'all have been here for 50 years or more. You've grown up in this church and you know how hard it is to, to, to make any change in a church over 50 years, right? Imagine making a change that's something that you've been doing for thousands of years, right? It's hard. That, that change comes hard and it's difficult to make some changes. But that, that God uh, would, would have to work in the lives of his apostles. And I remember this account in, in the book of Acts that, that Peter, that God had to give the apostle Peter a vision before he finally understood that, 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 that God's love and the gospel was for all people and not just for the Jews. And Acts 10, 9 to 16, it's recorded for us. It says, the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And, and, but Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has uh, cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. And of course, as you know, the rest of the story goes, as soon as uh, uh, Peter came out of his his trance, uh, there's a Gentile messenger uh, waiting at the door from Cornelius, the centurion. Uh, He was down there waiting and asking to see Peter to come to Caesarea. And so this was God saying that, that call no one unclean, that the gospel is for all people, that, that you know, he's using this, this imagery of animals, and you say, uh, uh, we, we are to abstain from these things, but it's changing. The, the covenant has changed, it's doing away with these things. And so that's what the message was there, that, that Peter went and preached the gospel, and Cornelius and every single Gentile there that heard the message of the cross were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. What do you think that, that, that Peter thought when he saw that? What do you think that the Jews that accompanied Peter thought whenever they saw that? It rocked their world, right? It opened their eyes that, that, that things are definitely changing. That if the, this notion, say, if, if, if God shows no partiality in whom he loves and who he is willing to save, how can we possibly find any justification for showing partiality towards any person or any people group? We can't. Right? We can't. We cannot possibly do that. See, that, that, that's the point that James will make for us tonight. Listen, if you're a bigot or a racist, you're not going to like this sermon. You're not going to like this sermon very much. If you're a snob or a cultural elitist basing your opinions on people off their financial uh, standing, you're not going to like this sermon either. And if you hold biases or you tend to show preferential treatment towards anyone, you're not going to like this sermon much either. And so I'm just letting you know ahead of time. But see, hopefully, after we are exposed to the Word of God tonight, God willing, your heart and mind will be renewed by the truth of God's Word. That you will both hear the Word and and be a doer of the Word when you leave this place. That you will no longer live under the deception that it's okay to be a racist Christian or a cultural elitist Christian. That you will be reminded that we are all the same. That we all have the same sin problem. That we all need the same grace and we all need the same Savior. Amen? That's the way it works. That's the way it's going to be. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and, and stand as we honor the reading of God's Word uh, tonight. James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. says, My brethren, do not hold fast the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there, if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves, and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, 
Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you were called? If you, are real, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not, commit, do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Father, we ask that you would help us to see the error of our ways. Lord, in large ways and small ways, every one in this room, if we're honest, we can search our hearts, Lord, where we tend to, to, to show partiality in one way or the other. We tend to show favoritism on, on one way or another, God. So, Lord, help us to see uh, the, the, the great error that we commit, that we become uh, uh, judges and, and, and evil with evil thoughts when we do these things, that we become uh, self-seeking and self-serving by, by doing these things, that... Uh, Lord, it's very displeasing to you. So help us to, to, to sit under your word tonight. Help us to, to learn from it and help us to be changed by it and help us to apply it to our lives as we leave this place. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So just to, to remind you of the context of, of where we're at in, in, in James, in this letter, he's writing to dispersed Christians, right? These dispersed Christians that were facing persecution because of their faith in Christ. But on top of that, they were facing some serious marginalization from the unbelieving world, right? That they, they were second-class citizens and they were being berated and, and all those things were taking a toll on them. Now, uh, you know, they should not have to deal with those same types of things within the church, should they? Should anybody, should anybody within the body of Christ have to face those same things? Did you have to face being marginalized in the church? Should, should we as a faith family, should we have to deal with those same things here within the church? Absolutely not, right? It's bad enough out there in the world, but to come into the faith family, to come into the church and have to deal with these same things is unthinkable. And see, this passage deals uh, specifically about dealing with one another when the church gathers together for instruction and for praise and worship and for times of fellowship, all these things. See, verse 2 tells us about a disturbing situation that took place during one of their times of assembly, that, that they were getting together, where the, the church was showing partiality towards a rich man and overlooking a poor man that the rich man was seen as more important than the poor man, and the rich man was, was seen as, as, as a possible asset for the church, and the poor man was seen as just another drain on the church, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You've probably seen this happen before, right? And you, you'll see somebody, maybe a new family coming in uh, uh, to visit the church, and, and, and maybe they're wearing suits and ties, the, the, the man is, and, and everybody looks clean and well-kept, and maybe you, you saw them drive up, and they're driving a nice nice car and, and just... You know, maybe when that time of offering comes around, you see them, you know, put in a wad of money or whatever the case, you, you tend to pay attention to them and you have another family come in and, and maybe they just look dirty, right? Maybe it's a, it's a whole gaggle of kids and, and, and they look like they just, like they, they slept in their clothes and just, you know, you're, you're, you're already drawing, you know, these conclusions about them. You're already judging them based off of what they look like. And so the one family is like, I'm, man, we need to get to know them. They, they look like they can, you know, really help us out. Whereas this other family, they're just going to wind up being a drain on the church. Well, I know what the, they must want something. That's why they're here. They're going to hit us up for money later, right? Start thinking these things and you start, you know, prejudging people. And that's what, what James is talking about here is to be careful. See, partiality, showing partiality, the word partiality means to have an unfair bias in favor of one thing or, or a person compared with another. It's, it's favoritism. And to be clear, this is an unfair bias towards someone based off of a mutual preference, more than likely, or something that they bring that will benefit you, right? That's how this works. That's what partiality is really what it boils down to, that, that ultimately showing partiality is selfish and self-seeking self -seeking at its core. And so like most of the biblical principles that we see in, in, in the Word of God, uh, they will apply. They will apply uh, both 
uh, inside the church and outside the church between believers and, and also in interactions with unbelievers. So what is it? What is it that causes us to do these things? What is the root cause of partiality uh, in the church? Why does this happen so often? James would answer and, and tell us that too many Christians don't fully grasp or don't really understand what it means to be a Christian, to, to be like Jesus in all things. See, in verse 1, it says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. You see, to be a, 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 a Christian, to be a follower of, or a disciple of our, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, it, it changes us. See, that Christians are to live and to do uh, all the things that Jesus did, right? That He is our Lord, that He is our Savior, and He is also our example in all things. That Christians are to love one another and serve one another without partiality. See, that's the thing, uh, one of the major things that, that sets us apart from uh, uh, non-believers, that, that Christians are to, to serve one another and meet needs for one another. See, our, our impartial love for one another is what really sets us apart. And that's what the Apostle John would say in John 13, 34, and 35. It says, a, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so, no matter how we try to justify it, because we do that, right? Whenever you're called on the carpet about Hey, you're showing favoritism. Hey, you're, showing, you're being partial to this person or these people or this family. We try to justify it. And no matter how we try to justify it, showing partiality is in no way a loving thing to do to a fellow Christian or anyone else for that matter. Amen? It's, it's, it's just the wrong thing to do. Plainly stated, showing partiality is unloving and is therefore unchristlike, which leads to our first point of tonight's message regarding the problem of partiality. Point number one, showing partiality is inconsistent. It's inconsistent with the character and the nature of Jesus Christ. Uh, verses 2 uh, to 4 says, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a, a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, this, this may have been reported to James or, or may have been something, just a hypothetical situation. We don't really know uh, for sure. Uh, but this situation was, was, was to use to demonstrate the ugliness of showing partiality in the church that sometimes we don't really know what we're doing is wrong until somebody points it out to us, Right? That sometimes we don't really know. We don't really get it. We don't really know until somebody says, like, you know, time out. Do you, do you even know what you're saying? Do you even know how you're treating this person? Do you ever, like, pause for a second and examine yourself and maybe see things from a different perspective and see how hurtful this is, how, what, what you're doing, and, and how demeaning this is by saying these things or doing these things? And that's what James is kind of uh, saying here in this passage, you know, that, that, that when we finally get to see it from other, another person's perspective, you know, see, from a worldly point of view, this would make sense, right? This scenario makes sense. From a worldly point of view, how, how this person was treated makes sense. It makes good business sense to do this. See, the rich guy, you know, he had resources and he had influence more than likely. That likely he has other rich friends that, that, that they all can invite in, right? So rich guy gets his rich friends and, and they all come to the church and now they're all tithing and they're all getting involved and giving love offerings. And, man, we're just rolling in cash, Right? Money's going to fix everything in the church, right? No. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But that's what you would think, right? Just imagine all the good that we could do with the money that we would get, uh, you know, that he would give to the church, right? This poor guy is just another burden for the church. The poor guy will hardly give anything to the church, right? He's poor, right? He might tithe, but like, you know, if he only makes, you know, $200 a week, what's a tithe? He's going to get 20 bucks, Right? That's not going to get us anywhere fast. So we want the guy who has lots of money to come and give lots of money to the church. That's what, that's what he's saying here in this, this situation. And this poor guy, he's going to tell his other poor buddies how we welcomed him here. And they're all going to show up here. And they're going to be wanting, you know, uh, food from us. And they're going to be asking us to help them to pay their bills. And, you know, because that's what poor people do, right? That's, that's how they are. That's not true. That's not true, but that's what he's saying here. That's the stereotypes. That's the, that's the wrong way of thinking. That's what the world thinks. That's how the lost world operates, and we're to be different. 
a counterculture. See, Jesus is not concerned with what a person can give to the church. Jesus is concerned with, with the condition of the person's heart. That's what he's concerned with. Rich or poor, it doesn't matter to him. That he was watching one day, and we, in our scriptures, you may be familiar with this, uh, this story. He was watching one day at the time of offering uh, and the disciples, and, and he made this key observation about a poor widow in, in the Gospel of Luke. Right, 21 to 1 to 4, it says this. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw uh, also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these uh, out of their abundance uh, have put in uh, offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. See, James said that when we show partiality in the church like this, we make ourselves out to be judges with evil thoughts, right? Judges with evil thoughts, that, that we are judging people by their outward appearances and not the content of their hearts. That our, 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 our thoughts are evil because we begin to see people merely as resources and not the precious image bearers of God that they are, Right? That's what he's saying here. That's the problem. We don't see people as image bearers. We don't see them as, as, as precious in God's sight. We see them as, hey, what can you do for me? What can you do for, what can, how, how can you benefit me? How can you benefit our church, right? That's what he's saying here, and that's a problem. That's, that's the, the inconsistency here. That's what he's pointing out, that we overlook their needs and only see how they can meet our needs or, or make our lives better. Let me ask you this. Is that the way Jesus looked at people? Is that how he, that Jesus looked at people that way? Is that the way that Jesus treated people? Absolutely not. Far from it, right? That, that he was God in the flesh, worthy of all honor and glory and praise. And he was the one that should have been treated like the king that he was. And, and yet it was him that, that took on the position of the lowly servant. That he came to give and to serve, not to take and to be served. That he treated all people the same like sick people that were in need of position that the scriptures would tell us tax collectors scribes pharisees fishermen government officials beggars cripples blind mute deaf adulterers prostitutes rich or poor jesus never showed partiality towards anyone and neither should we and neither should we see showing partiality is inconsistent with the character and nature of jesus but showing partiality is also inconsistent with who we are as Christians and as a church. All right, we can't do that. We can't do that. All right, point number two, showing partiality is illogical and out of step with the entirety of Scripture. Verses 5 to 7, we see this. It says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do, not they, do, do they not blaspheme the, that noble name by which you were called? You see, as you study your Bible, and, and, and I know some of y'all were going through the Bible reading plan, and, and, and if you're, we're almost out of Genesis, and I'm glad. I told the men this morning, I'm ready to get out of Genesis because I'm just wore out. I'm just wore out with Genesis, and uh, it just reminds me of... Just the sinfulness of man and God's grace. That's all I'm going to say about that. It's, just, it's been quite a challenge. But even back in the book of Genesis and moving more uh, forward into our Bibles, you'll see that, that the poor have always had a special place in God's heart. Always. always. It's always been that way. You'll, you'll see it over and over again that there's a special emphasis that God has placed on caring for those that cannot care for themselves, the, the poor, the orphans, and the widows. And, and going back all the way into the, uh, Leviticus, the Israelites were commanded to care for the poor in their midst by not harvesting all of their crops, right? They were supposed to leave the corners and, and, you know, for, the, for the, 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 those in need. And, and if anything was dropped or fell off the, the vine, they were to leave it on the ground for the, 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 the poor and the needy to come and gather. Uh, Leviticus 19 is where it's found at. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And of course, we know also in the book of Acts, the, the, the first deacons, the first ones that were called out uh, by God to serve the church in that special way, they, they were set apart 
to take care of the, the needs of the widows, right? And so this is ongoing. We see it all throughout the scriptures that widows and orphans and, and the poor, they, they represent who we are in a spiritual sense, right? When you think about it that way, I think maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe that's what God is trying to get through our, our, our heads is, is that we're the ones who are in need. See, because of our sin, uh, that, that we are condemned and without hope and that we are poor and we are unable to do anything to change our situation like the orphans and widows and the poor, that we are completely at the mercy of someone gracious enough to provide for our needs, right? Maybe that's what God's trying to demonstrate. Maybe that's why he has this, this, this special call, this special purpose, and this special heart for the ones in need, that Jesus met that need for us on the cross, right? He met that need that we could not meet ourselves, that James is quick to point out that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith, right? A, a great reminder, do you think... That, that, that the people that, that James was writing to needed to hear that. Uh, what a reminder, right? Because they're thinking that woe is me and God's done with us and, and, and he don't care about us, but he reminded them that, no, you're the ones that are, who are rich in faith. See, they, ne, ne, the, though neglected and abused here on earth, they will be the heirs of the kingdom is what James is reminding them of in this day. That we may not, we may not have all the things that wealth can provide us in this lifetime, we, but we are not living for this lifetime. We are living for an eternity in the kingdom of God. That's a big difference, right? Are you living for the here and now or are you living with eternity in mind? Right? That changes everything once you are able to get that through your head and, and live that way. And, of course, as a general rule, uh, uh, poor people are much more receptive to the gospel. Have you, fig- have, you, have, you, have you figured that out? Have you, you know, gone out to witness or you go into an area to share the gospel Poor people seem to be a lot more receptive to the gospel than rich people. And I'm not sure why that is. You know, maybe it's that, 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 that wealthy people tend to place more hope in themselves, right? They can fix their own problems and whatever the case is. But that's, that tends to be uh, true across the board. That, that, but, but money cannot fix our sin problem. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can fix that. that the, blood of Jesus and the, the blood of Jesus is not for sale. You can't buy it, right? It doesn't matter how much money you have. You can't buy it. And you can't earn it because it's free. And it can only be received as a gift. That's what Paul would say in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, sin is the great equalizer between the rich and the poor. Right? It's the great equalizer. Sin is the great equalizer between the rich and the poor. There is no such thing as a rich sinner or a poor sinner. We're all just sinners. Right, we're all just sinners. That James would appeal once more to how illogical it was to show partiality to the rich by asking these questions. Right, and you look back up in verse six and seven. It says, "Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called?" See, Pastor Johnny Hunt uh, noted it this way in, in a commentary I looked at this week. He says, "The very ones who trampled and maligned the fledgling church were the ones." Churches escorted to the most prominent places in worship assemblies. He said, it doesn't make sense. It's illogical. He said, why in the world would you do this? Why would you possibly do this? See, this was done solely to carry favor with the rich and the influential, not so they could hear the message of the gospel better. It wasn't like they were moving them up front so they could hear better. That wasn't the case. It was to win favor. It was to draw them in. See, this, this appears to be a very similar situation to what Jesus uh, uh, criticized the hypocritical pharisees though by always wanting the best seats for worship at the synagogues you see showing partiality is illogical and out of step with the entirety of scriptures but showing partiality in the church is also illogical because everyone needs equal access to the gospel everyone needs equal access to the gospel we don't get extra credit for baptizing rich people right we don't you know that's what i'm saying sometimes i think about uh, you know, just the strategy of the gospel and how some people spend a lot of times and we need to hit the, the big cities. And I understand that because there's just more people there. I, I get that. But see, we don't get extra credit. We don't get, there's no soul worth more than the other. There, a soul was a soul. Somebody won to Christ and somebody won to Christ. Whether they're poor or they're rich, it doesn't matter. And that's what James is trying to remind us of tonight. And then James would close this section with the biggest problem with showing partiality in the church. And this is the biggest of all, I think. Showing partiality is sinful. <laughs> it's sinful. 
Right? I, I never really thought of it that way until I studied this, this, this week. Plain and simple, plain, showing partiality is sinful. Verses 8 to 13. He says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. You see that? If you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So I'm just being honest with you. See, I, I understood. I, I knew that showing partiality was, wasn't the right thing to do, but I just didn't know that it was sinful. Right? Did you? Did you know that? Did you know that it was sinful to do that things? And, and, and why? Why is it sinful? James says that we violate the royal law when we show partiality. We, we violate the, the royal law. And some of you might be thinking, but, but Brother Mike, that we're, we're, we're New Covenant believers. We're not under the law, right? We're, we're, we're not under the law anymore, and we're under the, the New Covenant of grace, that, that we are not saved or made righteous by keeping the law, but what, what God has given us a law to obey His Word. It still applies, right? It still applies that, that we are under grace, that we are saved by grace. We're not saved by keeping the law, but everything that God has commanded us to do, we're still held to it. We're still held to it where the Bible, it still says that murder is sinful, that lying is still sinful, stealing is still sinful, idolatry is still sinful. So that James says that that when we fail to do what God says in his word, we commit sin and are transgressors is what the word says. That Jesus summed up what it means to be a Christian with these two commandments, right? In Matthew 22, 35 to 40, it says, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, And saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And that this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see here, and since I've been here, I try to simplify it. Our mission as a church, right? That we love God and we love people and I add in make disciples, right? That's, that's really what it boils down to be. And you want to say, what does it mean to be a Christian? What, what is our mission as a church? What are we all about? Loving God, loving people, and making disciples. That's what it's all about here. See, so, so, so let me ask you this. If you've been on the other side of it, how do you like being the victim of partiality? You ever been on that end? You ever been on the, the back side of it? It's not too pleasant, is it? You know, it's frustrating that where someone less qualified than you might get a job because uh, they're related to the boss. You ever had something like that happen? <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of head shaking, yeah. That happens. That happens. Nepotism is what they call that, you know. And, and, or, or maybe your idea gets shot down simply because you're the new guy, right? You're, you haven't been here long enough. You don't really get to say. You don't really get a vote in this. Your, your idea don't make any sense. We'll, we, we've been here longer. We'll decide what's going to take place, right? partiality that's that's how we see this play out that that call it whatever you want partiality favoritism discrimination bias prejudice god calls it what sin he calls it sin that's exactly what it is and like any other sin in our life we need to repent if we're doing these things are we guilty of this if we're the ones doing these things we need to repent of these things that james closes this section out with once again reminding us that we must apply the word of god to our lives to be Doers of the word. He says there, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. You see, saved people are judged based off of God's grace through the blood of Jesus. That saved people talk and behave like saved people. That saved people treat everybody the same, period. That saved people see all people as being precious in God's sight and as his image bearers. And verse 13 is both a test and a warning for us. Verse 13 says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so what James is saying here is that those that are able to show mercy are those that have received mercy. Right? You can't give away what you have never received. Right? If, you, if, you, if you've never received grace, you can't give out grace. If you've never received mercy, you can't be merciful. If you've never received forgiveness, 
you can't give away forgiveness. Does that make sense? He's saying it's evidence, it's fruit, it should be the outflow. If you've received these things, you give these things away. But if not, it should be a red flag for you. See, James is warning that if, if we claim to be saved by grace and then treat others without grace, our judgment will be without mercy. Right? Our judgment will be, will be without mercy, not because you will forfeit your salvation, but because you were never saved to begin with. That's what he's saying. He's saying that mercy will be without, your, your judgment will be without mercy. That saved people will have the fruit of the Spirit of evidence as evidence, in their salva- of evidence of their salvation in their life. Galatians 5, 16 to 25. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Did y'all get that? Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also Walk in the Spirit. That's what James is saying. That's what he's saying here, that this whole thing about following Christ and and, and showing partiality doesn't make any sense. It's sinful. And so as we close out tonight, let me ask you this. How can we guard ourselves from the sin of partiality here at Occupy 2? Because we can do it too here. We can do it here. And, and And we may be doing it, right, in some way, shape, or form. That we need to make sure that we are truly saved. That's how you do it. You examine your heart. Save people. Save people won't be the ones guilty of ongoing partiality, of, of practicing, this, practicing this sin. That we examine ourselves. That save people talk and act like saved people. That lost people talk and act like, toss pe- like lost people. That sounds like it should be obvious, but some people have, are confused about that. Right? If you... If you, if you uh, uh, walk like a duck and, and you and you quack like a duck. Guess what you are, a duck, right? And that's what that's what James is saying here. If your your life exemplifies these things, so let me ask you: Have you been transformed by the gospel? Right? Have you been transformed by the gospel? Are you walking in a newness of life? And so check yourselves and see if your life is marked by love and, and marked by joy and marked by peace and long suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, and, and, and gentleness, and self-control. So are you loving God and loving people, right? All people, right? Not just, not just your little clique, not just your family, not just, you know, just certain little groups, or not just people that are this color, or people that drive these kind of cars, or live in these neighborhoods, or work in these jobs. You know, we can't do that. We're not afforded that option. We're not allowed to do these things. All people. Listen. Let us not be guilty of ever catering to or showing partiality to any person or family based off of what their last name is or how much money or influence they have in the church. Right? I know that ever, never happens here, right? Right? Sure it does. Sure it does. We've got to stop. It don't matter who you are. It don't matter how big your family is. It don't matter how much money your family gives to the church. We all are on equal ground here. Right? We, we follow God's leadership. Right? Nobody, nobody has more leverage. Nobody has more clout. Nobody has more weight. There is only one boss here, and that's the Lord. And so we can't be that. We can't do those things. If we're doing any of those things now in any way, tonight is the time to stop. We need to repent of these things. Why? Because showing partiality, it's inconsistent. It's illogical, and most of, serious of all, it's sinful. Amen? All right. Well, let's pray. And we'll have a time of response. Father, we thank you for this word. It's one that, that, that I think sneaks up on us, that we, we know 
that it's not right. We know that it's not polite or it's not the fair thing to do to, to show partiality or, or to show favoritism. Lord, but we've never, if we're honest, we never thought of it as being sinful. So God, forgive us. Forgive us where we do this. Forgive us where we, we have shown partiality in the past. And God, help us to not show partiality in the future. Lord, help us to, 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 to love people. Help us to, to, to extend grace to, to all people regardless of their background, regardless of their race, regardless of their gender. None of that matters. Help us to see people like you see people. Help us to treat people like you treat people. Help us to to extend grace like we have received grace. Help us to extend mercy because we have received mercy. Help us to be forgiving because we have been forgiven. God, help us to be the type of church that you want us to be. Help us to be a church that is welcoming and inviting to all people. Help us to be a church that goes out into a community, to all areas of a community, not just this area or this area or this home or that home. Father, help us to be a people that is ser- a, a church that is serious about making the gospel known to all tribes, nations, and tongues. Father, we love you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.